was there, the Sunni, Sunnis in the army, they're the majority, but they argue that they're confined to bases, they don't really fight, I'm not sure if you met any <laughs> Sunni soldiers in, in your travels. Are you talking Iraq or Syria? Uh, Syria. They, 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 say, they say that the, the, the majority is Sunni, but they, they don't, they, they don't, they, aren't, they don't, don't fight purposely. Lucky them! Then they don't get killed. But actually, most of the most of the soldiers I met were uh, Sunni. Not that I went around asking them. Yeah, I didn't ask anyone. I just talked. I don't. Know. Didn't realize that would be. Here. I guess that was be. Well, I can't imagine them keeping some of the soldiers on the bases because they need all their forces to fight. In Iraq, it's a little different because things are so chaotic. But in Syria. Their entire army is mobilized. What happened, you know, when the elections came? And I know the newspapers here were really rabid about saying it's not a legitimate election, et cetera, et cetera. But there were thousands of people that actually uh, went to their embassies. And what did they do? Uh, in some countries, they were not allowed to go to the embassy and to vote, like in the US. What, what exactly happened? What did they do? Because they couldn't vote for, um, they wanted to vote, but they were not allowed to. Correct. Um, actually, I know a group of about 25 Syrians flew from the United States to go to Syria. So they well, went down to, okay. Yeah, There's actually hundreds of thousands of Syrians who live in the United States. Um, and most of them just, unfortunately, were not able to vote in this election. But even with that, they got, they didn't say the turnout, but the turnout was 73%. Um, think about it, about, I think it's like about 18 million adults in Syria, and there are 2.5 million adult refugees. So, and the amount of people that voted, it was like 70, it was about, it was about 4 or 14 million. So if you do the math, um, you know, 18 million adults, uh, 2.5 million refugees and still 14 million people voted. Um, you know, the turnout is a real success. And every adult is registered to vote. But I, I don't, I don't actually know, I mean, I imagine that people were very frustrated with their, to go to their embassy and they not be able to vote. It's just amazing because nothing, you don't, you don't see that in the media. Well, yeah, and nothing at all. More people in Europe probably went I, I hate to use the word probably, but our, our hotel was overrun. And there were others also. There were, every hotel in Damascus was full. And uh, I'm not even sure how people, well, people had to get there like through Beirut because the Damascus airport is shut down. There were like, when I went to fly to Latakia, there's like blast holes in the, in the tarmac. Uh, and there's like, I don't know, there was like half a dozen airplanes, most of them were covered with uh, tarps. Uh, just sitting there. Uh, so, but from Europe, it's not that bad of a trip to go to Syria, whereas from the United States, you have to fly somewhere and then drive in. So you would probably be coming in, I would guess, from uh, Beirut's about the only safe place I could think of you could come in from. Actually. So. Um. My question is this. You know, everything you're saying uh, is very helpful to me. Um, but I'm, what, what I'm confused about is, like, I've been following the whole Ukraine thing, you know, since the since, uh, beginning of it, and ha have been able to find left journalists on sites like, like Counterpunch and, 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 and Truth Out, and, and, uh, who are telling me a very different scenario than what I was reading in the New York Times. <coughs> and the demonization of, of Putin by the Western media, I was able to find trustworthy journalists who could tell me what was really going on. So what I'd like to ask is, who are the journalists that I can trust who are talking? Who are telling this story? Uh, I haven't found much. Maybe I don't know where to look. But it was accessible to me with respect to the demonization of Putin. But the demonization of Assad. 
the, the <coughs> counter story to that by left journalists, I haven't, haven't found them. Uh, I mean, I know, Judy, you read voluminously in all these other, you know, uh, media, uh, but, but I'm curious why I haven't found this narrative. You, you see what I'm saying? On Democracy Now! and then, where, where is that narrative uh, amidst this demonization of Assad? That's my question. You want to go first? You want to um, I, I know it's, it's a hard question. The, the chemical stuff, but other than that, I don't it's know. It's a hard. Where. It's a hard question. First of all, nobody was paying much attention to Syria. The fact that Syria before this started, and the fact that Syria um, helps Hezbollah and Iran, puts them further out than Putin. Putin's like just an extension of the Cold War, but so there's a lot of opinions on that. There have been all along. But uh, the Assads have consistently uh, stayed, uh, been a, a meeting place for the axis of resistance in the Middle East, something the United States finds heinous. And um, there are places that put it together, like Global Research and uh, some other places. But I know my reading, the way I've done it, and I'm happy to share my link list with anybody, is I just search and I scan articles and I look for people I respect and I look for details that are mentioned that, uh, and I read in foreign press uh, and in Arabic. There are certain people like, uh, my favorite is Angry Arab, uh, the Angry Arab uh, News Service. Assad Abu Khalil is a Lebanese guy who lives in uh, Southern California or somewhere in California. And he works, uh, he's a professor of political science at a small university there. Uh, and he travels a lot back and forth to the Middle East. And he, he hates the Assad because when he was a boy, um, Hafez Assad, not Bashar, uh, was used by the United States to do some heavy handed stuff in Lebanon. And he desperately wanted to be accepted by the rest of the world. He was like, I don't want to be a pariah. I want to be with the good guys. And so they said, OK, you want to be with the good guys, you can do X. You can go into uh, Lebanon, and you can hold the line here. And, and so what happened was, so Assad doesn't like the, uh, Assad Abu Khalil doesn't like the Assad. Okay, but can you just tell me his name so I can write it down? It's Assad, A apostrophe S-A-D. No, it's A-S apostrophe A-D. Uh, a B U K H A L I L, and uh, but shortly into this whole thing happening, like by summer of 2011, he went, "Oh my God, this isn't what they're saying it is at all." And this is a guy who can read the Arab press and talk to people in Arabic, and who goes back and forth to Syria and uh, and more often to uh, Lebanon. And uh, so when he came around, I went, and then he was saying, I hate the Assads, but this thing is horrible for the Syrian people. They need to have a stable government right now. So you can read that. You can read, um, there's something called, uh, um, I'm trying to think, uh, Garrett was talking about it in, uh, uh, at any rate, there's a Lebanese newspaper that's really good. Al Akbar, was it? Al Akbar, yes. thank you. Al Akbar, uh, which I strongly suggest, Al Akbar English. And uh, it's a socialist Lebanese newspaper. Um, and um, so, like I say, I'll share my link list. That's how I do things. Uh, I look around but for stories. I'm just, I'm just curious why. I mean, with respect to the demonization of Putin and the, the alternative narrative, you know, it's in the nation, it's, in the, it's all over the place. With all this, you know, Assad throwing barrel bombs on neighborhoods and all this kind of stuff that we're reading about, one would expect that the left press in the United States would be providing a counter story to it. Well, and I don't find it. The left in the United States loves revolutions. That's another reason why the Ukraine is doing okay, because the rebels are the side that we're on. But uh, the, um, and the, uh, the other thing is that the, um, look at Gaddafi for comparison, same story. We destroyed, just 
destroyed Libya. We bombed it to smithereens. We had sent a bunch of thugs, you know, a bunch of thugs found him and, and raped and murdered him and tortured him to death. And Hillary Clinton laughed about it and the left didn't complain. I don't understand it, but it's something to do with our culture. And our culture is in love with revolutions, with that whole freedom and democracy thing. And that's why it's a lot easier to side with the East Ukrainians than with the government of Syria or, uh, because the governments of Syria and Libya uh, have supported on, on their own level, they have supported the resistance to our government, as opposed to popular self resistance to any government. These are the little guys on the playing field of government who have resisted uh, the United States. And they have been very, uh, and they have been politically restricted. However, they've also done uh, amazing things to build these societies from nowhere and, you know, provide reasonable quality education and health care. Gaddafi put in a water system in Libya that was like the best, and we destroyed it, among the other things we destroyed. You know, uh, I don't understand why the left is acting with they, the way they do, uh, but I see it, uh, I mean, I see it in my own abilities to get published. So we I have, don't know. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the stories that we've written, we get kind of put together with a group that we went with called the Syrian Solidarity Movement. If you look that up. Oh, look, that's a good one. You'll, look, yeah. you'll see all the posts from Counterpunch to, I don't even know. I, what, what, what about it's just a blog called Syria Solidarity Movement. You know, I write for Workers World. It's a you know socialist newspaper that's a weekly newspaper. I have some. <laughs> that was for a long time. <laughs> we've been writing about this for years, and we've written a book about it too. And there's been a lot to say about it. And I think that it, the question is, that it is a tougher question. And a lot on the left supported the like the so-called revolution, which is a counter-revolution. Well, and the, and the Syria comment is an interesting source, and it's kind of funny because Josh Landis actually came around after a while and wholeheartedly, he did the opposite of Assad Abu Khalil. He, the guy who owns this blog came around and started wholeheartedly supporting the revolution in Syria, the revolution. And, uh, but, um, initially, because I was reading his blog regularly at the time all this started, because I started out being interested in Lebanon. And, uh, he, uh, they were printing things, like they printed uh, the story, again, people could read Arabic. They printed the story about how uh, the rebels in Idlib, this is a, a town or city on the border <coughs> of Turkey, sent their wives and children into a refugee camp in Turkey, and then they set a trap for the Syrian army, and they killed about 50 soldiers. They essentially set an ambush, called them for help, and killed them all. And uh, their wives and children are still in that refugee camp in, Syria, in uh, Turkey. And they, uh, but that story was actually published on Syria Comment, or else I wouldn't have known. And the other thing I saw on Syria Comment, and I disagree actually with some other uh, American uh, leftists about this, because I'm a peace activist, but they were showing um, videos of the early uh, protests not the earliest ones, but the protests in um, Hama. I can't remember if it was Hams or Hama. But essentially, they showed this video after uh, the protests had left the streets. There were burning cars on fire all over the place. There was a bus pushed over and set on fire and charred. There were young men riding around, standing on top of a fire truck, celebrating. And there were little children running in and out of all this wreckage, and I thought, what kind of a peaceful march is this? And again, I saw this on Syria Comment. I also saw the article uh, when the original incident uh, happened in, I think it was Hama, that really triggered things to start to come apart. Uh, the Syrian government sent someone because they agreed that the governor there had been excessively violent. And so they sent a delegation to 
take that government out of power, work with the people to put a new governor in, and straighten things out. And the people rejected it, and they used Molotov cocktails to burn the uh, police station to the ground. And again, I'm going, hmm, this is a peaceful demonstration. Uh, you know, and to me, so that's places where I got information. But I had already read biographies of uh, Hafez Assad and members of Hezbollah and stuff that were in the open, uh, you know, that are just books that are written. And um, by scholars, largely, and reporters. So uh, that's another source. And interestingly, after they've been supporting this revolution all this time, I went there just the other day to see what's up on Syria Comment. And there was an article, I can't remember now, but it was uh, once again showing that, uh, I think it was about how the uh, Takfiris have overrun the, uh, the FSA and basically decommissioned it. But I can't remember for sure. But if you go there, it's the top article. Do you want to see if there's more questions? Yes. Yeah. More questions. Well, I think you've already had a question. I'm totally fine with you having another one, but is there other? So, uh, no one's uh, raising their hands. Uh, yeah, I was um, asking about um, what was it? So, about that in the, in the beginning, um, during the month of March, there um, I heard about uh, not only you know these violent protests, but um, shooting at unarmed riot police. I, I've heard about um, interesting enough jihadists entering into Syria, which Al Jazeera journalists actually saw and then resigned in protest because they, were, uh, they refused to show this. They think they went on to form Ma'an News Network. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, and then, uh, you know, I, I also read an article about the independent years later that any Christian said that, that they saw mobs of people basically yelling, um, Christians to bury root and Alawites to the grave. I mean, that, that this who supported the uh, re re revolution. So they, they, they said that this was all fake, but um, this apparently happened. I mean, uh, did you hear stories about, about this, what really happened during March versus versus the mainstream narrative of, the, of this peaceful protest against the poor regime, et cetera? Well, some of that was covered on Syria Comment, actually, which was why it was so interesting that a couple months later they shifted their ground and started covering. But they started covering it from the standpoint that was interesting to Syrian Americans, who many of whom are... Well, they're in America because they didn't get along with the government. But as you can see, even that's not entirely true because a lot of them really wanted to vote and, and, and to uh, bring Assad back to power because nobody wants to see their country destroyed. You know, and, and that has been the result. You saw that picture of Hans. You know, uh, so uh, at, nobody really wants to see that. And the government has actually, in spite of the discussion, and obviously they, uh, it's a civil war, so a lot of bad things have happened, but the government has worked hard to, uh, to bring people out of areas before they attack them, and, what, and to like create a siege and then bring out as many of the civilians as possible before they actually initiate the uh, fighting. And there are more, uh, more displaced people within Syria than there are outside of Syria. And the people within Syria, like the ones in that place in Aleppo, uh, or that, uh, those people from Aleppo that are in Latakia, or Tartus, wherever I was, um, they uh, have much better services than the people in other countries because they have their citizenship services that the Syrian government would give to anyone plus uh, shelter and uh, things like drinkable water and all that stuff that's just automatic because they're not in a camp. They're actually supported by the uh, community that they come from. Yes? I don't read a whole lot of, of uh, leftist um, perspectives. I do read Workers World faithfully, so that's where I get most of my left-wing information from. But it just seems instinctual to me that you support what the United States doesn't support and <laughs> don't support what the United States does support. The reason we're 
not supporting Assad or Hezbollah or Hamas or, or Iran is because they don't dance to the United States' tune. I mean, they say, well, Assad is brutal. Well, yes, Assad might be brutal, but the United States supports a lot of brutality. We supported Hosni Mubarak for 30 years, and he was brutal. And Al Sisi now. And Al Sisi now. Um, <laughs> we, whatever the United States doesn't support, I support, and vice versa. Um, so, so therefore, say we're against him because he's brutal. Well, we support a lot of brutal. The brutal well, reality before. is, he's not as brutal as the Saudis and um, the Gulf monarchies, which are the people paying for this insurgency that's in Syria and Iraq right now. And another thing is that this is Afghanistan all over again. If you remember in the 1980s, there was a government in Afghanistan, which, which was even more socialist than, um, than Assad. We supported the Mujahideen, which was a collection of different terrorists and right-wing groups that, that exist in Syria now. We supported them, and when they overthrew the, the socialist government, look what happened, we got the Taliban. Mm -hmm. And then we had to go in there a, a, a 10 years later to overthrow the Taliban, which we helped put in power. Well, this is what the people there, Abdeen is going to be next, but the people in, uh, I talked to some a friend, uh, an activist in Kabul, who's a, uh, um, he uh, has an organization where they take street kids in, and so they have a bunch of kids that are called Afghan Peace Volunteers. And I talked to Hakeem on the phone a couple weeks ago, and he asked me, because we're talking about Americans <coughs> rising up for Palestine, and he said, oh, by the way, do you know how many children die every week in Afghanistan from the violence of the war that's still going on there? And I said, uh, no. And he said, 40. And he said, and it's been getting worse the last couple of years. And the thing is that the American presence exacerbates that situation and keeps it going because it keeps everybody fighting. And uh, so I thought at that time, when we talked, there was actually more children than die every week in uh, Palestine. But of course, it's a bigger area and Israel quickly beat that record. But the reality is though, how many years have these 40 children a week been dying in uh, Afghanistan? You know, and uh, so it's hard, to, uh, it's hard to really think differently. And it's very sad because there are groups like, uh, you know, there are leftist groups in this country who pretty consistently support the U.S. government. And I have to say that I, was, I felt betrayed, betrayed when Amy Goodman started supporting the Libyan government, I mean the Libyan rebels. Uh, I just I couldn't even like wrap my mind around it. I was like, because up to that point I like thought she was, you know, so anyway. But um, Jean wanted to ask a question, so I'm going to stop. Well, it's more of a, of, a, of a comment in a way. I, I just heard of an item just yesterday, or maybe the day before, that um, out of the Edward Snowden documents, someone has picked up that um, the U.S. government has been supporting the, in the Ministry of Interior of Saudi Arabia <laughs> to help them with surveillance. Now, this is one of the most reactionary, oh. oppressive, undemocratic, absolute monarchy, which treats the Treasury you know, like their own personal pocketbook, everything that they say that they're all against. And they are, they are supporting it with U.S. tax dollars, giving them aid, and I'm sure all kinds of ideas and, and weapons and things. And um, the reason that they put down in their own document was that this is a, they want to, have something called regime maintenance <laughs> that, that, that they need to make, and it, it's probably true from their point of view. And I think what, what one thing we need to remember is what another thing that Judy said, you know, it's not up to us to choose uh, who the people of, of, of other countries, you know, are, are, 
are selecting and so forth. These people are engaged, in many cases, in life and death struggles. And for people, you know, on the left or wherever, to sit and say, oh, you know, geez, it's making it tough for me here. They're not doing something that makes it easier for me to argue with my neighbor. No, that's not what it's about. We have, we give unconditional, I believe, we should give unconditional support for self-determination. Mm -hmm. We don't impose conditions on it. You know, when, when children are being slaughtered and killed and everything like that. Um, and yet, uh, the other key thing is, is imperialism. It's imperialism, and, and, and it, imperialism takes a lot of different forms, and including propaganda, and including the media. Um, it, it, it is a very good question when you ask, where can you get reliable information? Because it certainly won't come from very many of the U.S. mainstream media. Just an interesting thought that just crossed my mind in terms of the popularity of some of these people. Um, someone said to me Monday night, oh, and then there's that awful guy on Ahmadinejad. I wonder what he's up to. And I said, um, he was a two-term president, and he's not president anymore because when his two terms ended, somebody else got elected. And the person was like stunned because they heard him called a dictator so many times that it never occurred to them that was true. And added on to that, and uh, just, just a quick reference is that, both Bashar Assad and Ahmadinejad were guys who drove to work, up until this rebellion in Syria, drove to work in their own car. Drove to work in their own car, behind a wheel, by themselves. And uh, Ahmadinejad used to go to these uh, towns in the rural areas and stand on the back of a pickup truck and speak. And I can get documentation for that. And you know, if, if our president has to ride in an armored car everywhere he goes, and he goes into a McDonald's, I was in Kurdistan when they had this special about President Obama goes into McDonald's, mm -hmm. and there was this, uh, this military guy uh, talking to me because I was like the only English-speaking person around, and everyone who spoke English came and talked to me. And uh, he said, oh, I can't believe that guy. What a wuss comes in, you know, surrounded by the Secret Service into a McDonald's, you know. And uh, because they know that in their own countries, the leaders, you know, actually are able to walk out and into the streets and, and without armor. <laughs> and so somehow, you know, there must be some acceptance of the leadership there that doesn't exist here. Sometimes I think that this support for rebellions here is, uh, what do you call it when you put something off on someone else because you can't do it yourself? Projecting. Huh? It's projection. Right, it's a projection of our own wishes, you know? Right In which there. case, yeah. let's do it. Let's have a rebellion, <laughs> you know, because uh, we are the ones who need one. Yes? Um, um, Oh, um, I have sort of a question and then sort of like a, just kind of like a comment. Um, so like Syria's initial um, protests, um, what were their, I'm just curious, um, I know somewhat of their original complaints and their original reasonings for protesting, but I was wondering if you could sort of like review what those are, um, what their complaints are against Assad. Oh, go on. I can try, I mean, most of it, it's true that it was a one-party government, and that there wasn't, and, and things have changed actually since then. In 2012, they, have over, they just completely overhauled the Constitution, and now there are nine different parties represented in their um, legislature, including like four different communist parties, which is funny. But uh, then there's, um, there are, another major question is, you know, economic conditions and austerity. And, and a lot of that was internally caused, a lot of that drew and went over with water and with drought. And a lot of it was also externally caused by, and, and some of it is 
just based on the fact that Syria is a relatively poor country. Um, and, and there are there are truly internal contradictions, there are truly internal problems of any capitalist society um, that can't meet the needs of the people. Same with our occupied Wall Street. You know? But the problem is that when the United States government comes to help your protest in your country, they usually have very clear ulterior motives and they're not fighting for workers or, <laughs> or people. <laughs> Jobs or education or freedom or you know social welfare programs anything so I don't know if I covered every single reason but I believe that it's generally projected as um, political freedom and economic security. There's there's also I'll just add a couple things uh, to that one is that the uh, um, the Assad government because it. it Bashar Assad went to finish his schooling in uh, London, and his wife is actually a Syrian uh, UK citizen, and um, she's a banker, and um, she's uh, um, and so um, you know I saw this the Saif al Islam has caused some big problems in uh, in um, Libya as well because they sent their sons to the West, because that's where the important people are. And even they kind of believed it, you know, and that, you know, that there was something special out there that was denied to them, and they were able to send their sons there. And their sons were successful, and these guys came back, and so uh, Bashar Assad came back, and he, isolation is a terrible thing. So he started, you know, doing some business with the IMF, and he started looking for ways to integrate Syria with the world economy. And so some of those had price tag, as do all things like that. And so he found that, um, you know, they had to reduce the subsidies that they were giving to people, some of the subsidies. Right at a time, like in 2010 and 2011, when they had this drought problem in Turkey bugging them too. And uh, so, and plus which their neighbor, Iraq, was just had just exploded, so there was a lot of pressure from that too, and they had like I think was it a million and a half Iraqi refugees in Syria, and as I say, Syria as they have done at least as long as I know for the last forty years, uh, took the refugees in, they let them go to school, unlike Jordan, they let them, uh, uh, they allowed them to have medical care. They essentially didn't bother them. They, they couldn't get a job in the government, obviously, but they set up their own little shops and things. And so there was a lot of pressure on this already impoverished country to take in all these people and integrate them. And so that was another uh, kind of problems that were happening. But there was an incident in, I believe, Hama, where uh, some boys did something, some teenage boys, and um, Somebody, I don't know if it was the army or the police or whatever, at the governor's bequest, opened fire on them and killed some of them. And this is the incident I was talking about, that the Syrian government, and I was reading this, I was following this in Syria Common. The Syrian government sent, some, took this guy and said, this is, you know, unacceptable, and removed him from his job, and they sent a delegation there to apologize to the people and to put some kind of, because uh, this is what these very authoritarian governments do. They take responsibility for everything that happens, for better or worse. And, uh, and they uh, appointed a new governor. And that's when things really started to get heated, though, because now they had a serious issue, like repressive government kills children, you know. And, uh, the, uh, and the, somebody firebombed the police station while the government... Uh, delegation was like still in town, which of course caused them to retreat. And so there, when there's unrest, the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria has been uh, at odds with the government for a long time, and this was a great issue for them. And this is like the center of the area where they're uh, <coughs> strong. And if, if you'll notice, like uh, it was a big deal in Egypt too, that the Muslim Brotherhood actually came to power in Egypt, uh, where they were actually more humble. They were already involved in the government in other ways. Um, because the Muslim Brotherhood has uh, a history 
of uh, assassination attempts towards uh, the governments that, of the countries where they live and stuff like that. And that's been a problem also for Hamas, because they also are Muslim Brotherhood. So just like another question would be like, um, so like the initial, the very initial protest, like the primary motivator wasn't so much, well, it was kind of a combination of all these things, of the, you know, um, their neighbors, uh, pressure from their neighbors and droughts and everything else, as well as this sort of thing um, that sparked, it sounds mm -hmm. more like riots than protests. Right, right, but that things. isn't how they were but described was, right. to us. And the, uh, um, and the results were, uh, and at some point, and I'm not sure where this was either, there were actual peaceful protests, but they started calling for the downfall of the government, and uh, there was some kind of sniper fire, and both military people, or both police and civilians were killed. And this is actually kind of similar to Kiev, because uh, everybody says they didn't do it. Right. Somebody did it. We don't know who. Well, and there, were, there were peaceful protests in... Um, what were like the, I guess like the demands of the people? Because well, I mean, like in the U.S., like when there was the whole Occupy movement, you know, it was it was peaceful, but it was portrayed as violent. So I'm wondering, was that like sort of what happened in Syria, or was it actually violent to begin with? Like there was just riots, and it was. Well, this is a disputed uh, fact. Uh -huh. My sense is that there was a measure of violence from the beginning, but I'm certainly, uh, I'm you know. It's disputed on all sides, but the reality is that initially, you know, they had problems with not having jobs. See, it's worse even than poverty. Nothing to do and nowhere to go. Uh, and not having, and so, and, and, and not having power from the standpoint of the Muslim Brotherhood. Right, one party state. Right. So, the, um, so it's really hard for us now to look back and know but it does appear to, that there were, whether they came from one side or another, or were some outside party, there were definitely instigators that upped the ante. And that very quickly the U.S. was causing, calling for Assad to step down. And that's a very... Uh, well, it was politically motivated on our part. First. Yeah, but by doing that, they aggravated the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Even before the Free Syrian Army, they were calling for Assad to step down. I, it's interesting because if you look at a situation like Ukraine, um, you can draw some parallels and, and draw the, and bring in the role of the United States. When there is a popular protest in the Ukraine, um, you know, and as we all often talk about, you know, revolutions bring in all different classes um, for the overthrow of the government. You know, sectors of all, all different classes. But, um, you know, if you look at the Ukraine and how the maiden movement went. Um, you know, it arose as this protest against austerity, and you know, it was kind of fueled by a kind of anti-Russian bigotry. Um, it was fueled by a lot of different elements, but the ultimate outcome of it was a very right-wing um, movement. Right. And we saw that in, in all of the Arab Spring, you saw these different movements, tremendous, like starting in Tunisia, one of the most <coughs> righteous and tremendous movements and a lot of you know, left-wing you know, socialists and communists were involved in that movement. And even to today, it, it really, it's not settled, but it, it hasn't, in almost all of these aspects, in almost all of these political movements, none of them have been advantageous to the left. And that's because of the role of the United States. And there's no space for a left-wing revolution in this period, as long as the United States is on everyone's back. And is, and is making life hell. And there's no possibility that any progressive movement in Syria could have happened once the United States, basically starting in 2005, when the United States started you know, really propagating a right-wing organizing. And, and it's not that the US is all powerful, but then within six months of these protests started, the Free Syrian Army had billions of dollars of military and they had already assumed an entire new government that was based, that was founded in Qatar. <laughs> so I mean, it's, it, the whole concept is totally bizarre that this movement, I mean, even if it started for the best reason, 
It became a completely, just like the Maiden, even if the Maiden protest in Ukraine started with the best reason, it ended up as a neo-fascist movement. And, and the character of it all, altered dramatically. And I think that's ultimately to do with the impact of the United States. Yeah. I, I guess like, um, sorry, uh, my like, perspective of it is sort of like, it's almost like a lost opportunity, right? Like, no one's gonna say like Assad is like a perfect leader. Um, although sometimes it sounds like some people kind of apologize for him in a way. <clears throat> but um, it just seems like a lost opportunity for a good social revolution in a way. Whether you know, you're a socialist or whatever, um, a one-party government is not a legitimate form of governance. And and they did yeah, yeah, rewrite yeah. the Constitution and change it. Right, that. now they have, yes. But the point, well, they did it shortly after, actually. They oh. met with people who, who had grievances who were willing to meet with them and did it within a year or so, in 20, 2012. So it's not, uh, so they were moving uh, in the right direction. But the, it is a lost opportunity in the sense that so much destruction surrounds it that it will take decades just to restore the society there. Rajesh? Um, is, wasn't this kind of like a, a, a re-ignition of the Cold War and the fact that Syria was the only uh, country in the Middle East that had a Russian, that had a, a Soviet, I mean, Russian base, right. Russian military base, and there's been a long partnership between Syria and Russia, so that had there not been this establishment, we might have seen if, uh, if Assad had not been supported by Putin, um, they would have probably been taken over mm -hmm. by the billions that were coming from the Saudis and the United States, filtered Thanks, through the Saudis. It's a great point, and, it I think is. It's totally, and, it, and it shows a new world alignment that's developing. Mm -hmm. because. When Obama went to the UN last summer, based on these faked, or not faked, but real, but misled, misleading chemical weapons attacks, when Obama went to the went to the UN to demand a no flight zone, just like the same no flight zone they got in Libya, which led to you know 8,000 bombs within the first month, um, you know, Russia and China said no, and it's and it's not because they're great countries, it's not because they represent you know, the beacon of hope for humanity necessarily. It's because they're opposed to the United States and they have their own interests. And and that development, and even more recently, the development of you know Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa creating a new development bank. They call it BRICS. It's about fifty billion dollars involved in that. In Latin America there's a development called ALBA, which uh, the development of you know Venezuela, Cuba, Bolivia and in other countries in the area coming together and saying we're opposed to the United States imperialism. There's, an, there's a whole development in the world today of countries coming together in a new kind of front. And it's different because it's, it's not like the Cold War. And, but it, when there are real alliances within it. And, and like Judy said, there's an alliance between you and even the first photo of tonight in our slideshow was an alliance between Iran, Syria, um, you know, Hezbollah, and then in Palestine. There's an alliance, and it's and it's a very objective alliance. It's who's threatened by the U.S. and, and you know who is with the U.S. and who's threatened by the U.S. And we can only hope that that develops to a point which it makes it impossible for the U.S. to fight wars around the world, which makes it impossible for the U.S. to do what it wants to do ruthlessly, because we know that's not in the interest of the people of the United States. And, and one other follow -up. it seems like during the Cold War we, we supported anything that was opposing socialism. So we supported all these sheiks and uh, religious kind of the Muslim Brotherhood. But then when we, in the 21st century, we see the Muslim Brotherhood, I mean like kind of like this pan-Arab Islamic uh, movement kind of gaining too much strength. So now we're, um, so, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of like in between. The U U.S. doesn't know whether to then go back and support some of these secular secular um, governments. So I think, you know, unless we take the United States out of the equation, where they keep on playing off the fundamentalism of religion, they're just trying to basically uh, diminish pan-Arab or, or regional strength, or regional, mm -hmm. regional arrangements, right. by any means necessary, whether it's uh, opposing, you know, 
being supportive of socialism at one point, or or you know secularism, or or opposing or supporting um, you know Islamic. Uh, so I'm not so certain that the Muslim Brotherhood at this point, um, you know, is isn't con don't perceive themselves as a, a regional um, kind of uniter themselves, as far as you know using religion to kind of unite. Um, the region. So I don't think that um, the Iran and I don't think they're the only um, arrangement that sees themselves as a regional kind of connection against the U.S. I think also there's the new kind of Muslim Brotherhood movement that also see, perceives itself as a, as a counter to the United States or, or foreign intervention. But it's, but it's contradictory, though, because mm -hmm. because the Muslim Brotherhood has a religious ideology, um, mm -hmm. it has it, it, it takes contradictory stance. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's spread, you know, Hamas, which is you know, leading the resistance in Palestine, mm -hmm. um, or you know, the people in Egypt selected the Muslim Brotherhood to represent their revolution, mm -hmm. um, and then the U.S. deposed them. Mm -hmm. well, uh, regardless of what you think of them, I'm not, I'm not saying that mm -hmm. I'm a big fan or whatever, but. Then, yeah, you know, and then the Muslim Brotherhood in, in, in Syria is trying to overthrow Assad. Yeah. So it's kind of a they, they play in different cool. roles. They do play different roles, and in Egypt and Hamas, and uh, they do not. They are not religious fanatics. They're not exclusivists, and they are not um, preparing to like change the rules of society back to the way they are in Saudi Arabia. And it's actually kind of interesting, because I just read an article yesterday by um, um, a uh, professor in Syracuse uh, on counterpunch, actually, where he was saying that in Libya right now, uh, the militias controlled by the Americans and the Saudis are fighting with the ones controlled by, the, by Qatar and the Muslim Brotherhood. And I mean, is this crazy or what? Meanwhile, there's these whole groups of civilians who are just having their lives over and over made unlivable. I just, you know, before it ends, I just want to really thank both of you to, you know, being here tonight because I'm glad you organized this meeting, Judy, because it was very timely, like I said, because we really needed to know a great deal what's going on. Uh, in in the Middle East, especially in this just la last few weeks uh, in the assault in Gaza. I just wanted to say that this coming Saturday, if anybody from Rochester, New York, would like to go to New York, there is a huge protest being organized, and it's called The World Stands with Gaza. And it's very similar to the demonstration that Answer did in in uh, Washington, D.C., to my understanding, there are 50,000 people, and we hope there'll be 50,000 people this Saturday or more, and they will be marching in Columbus Circle, and they will be going down to the United Nations, and I think, you know, it would, it's really, really an important event, really important mm -hmm. event. Can you, can we end with suggestions that we can do anything we can do locally? Do you have your answer? You are the local organizer. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm like saying I, my problem is that is this is who came and um, well, where Josh was at a meeting with me was it last week? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On Palestine. So, yeah. I and none of those people came. And I actually asked a couple of them to come and be speakers and talk about Palestine a little, and still they didn't come. Mm -hmm. Because um, their stance against, their stance for the rebellion in Syria is so strong that they didn't want to hear this. <coughs> and um, I don't know the answer. I mean, that's, this meeting is my first initiative towards an answer. Uh, you know, we can publish our results, however, and, you know, but. People have to choose to accept uh, things the way they are, and unfortunately, the the left groups that are closer to the American government stance are are e are more accessible to people, and therefore they get the first wave of people uh, who are frustrated with our government. They they take a short step instead of a long one, 
And I don't know how to, how to invite them to take the next step, honestly. Mm -hmm. I wish I did. You get the U.S. government. <laughs> Well, it's, it's, you know, uh, people really are afraid and don't want to do that, unfortunately. That's the problem. The good source is World Group Socialist website. Um, they um, just want to throw it out there. They, uh, they lean against the side and the rebels. And they, they, there are trust kids who, who, who do this, but they're, they're um, uh, in fact, the ISO, which, which you mentioned, uh, for, uh, the, the ISO is the one that, that, that didn't want to come and speak. They're, um, they're a fractured tendency. And the, the World Socialist website is so popular, they're so trusted in the news sources that, uh, that they're, they're, um, the people that go to the website um, are more than the entire ten tendency of the uh, um, ISO and British Socialist Workers Party combined. So um, I suggest that. Um, but also, yeah, go to Rochester Against War. I'd uh, throw that out there as well. Facebook page. Is there an ISO in Rochester still? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's the, that's who's not here. Uh -huh. They're the ones that you were referring to. Mm -hmm. the ones uh, you were referring to. Yeah, and they, they have a fairly lively membership too because they're on the college campuses recruiting. And as you say, it's much easier for the students to take that much of a step away from what of what they've been raised with than it is to come this far. But it's also true that the ISO isn't working harder at it. I mean they they're entrenched on the campuses and their leadership's a little younger than I am, anyway. So it's a little bit narrow. Yeah, you know, it's mm -hmm. narrow to be just entrenched on college campuses because there's a whole community out there. And, um, well, they're training a, a whole round of activists to come out. I used to be one of them. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there is hope. <laughs> people have it too. People have it to this contact. Do we need contact information? It, I can, I'll, if you want to write down my email address, I, w I am willing to share. I'm going to, well, actually what I'll give you is my blog, because I'll put my slideshow up there. And my blog is deconstructedgold.com. And I have, uh, and my email address is on it. Yeah, you may have that. And uh, I don't, I'm not totally consistent because I'm also the web administrator for Upstate Drone Action, which is a very demanding task. So, uh, I'd like to say this has been very provocative. Very you guys are incredibly informed. Now I don't have to read all those articles. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so well, thank you. Thank uh, you very thank much. You. Yeah. <laughs>